Hi. Hello. Hello. Hey. Hey, I'm Elmo. Welcome to the National Maritime Museum Greenwich. Thanks for joining us for the third session in this series of Needle and Skin. With me this evening to look at art, to look at skin art and the psyche are Dr. Rebecca Owens, lecturer in psychology, faculty of health science. Sorry, thank you for health sciences and well-being at the University of Sunderland. And Brownie, professional tattooist, amateur philosopher and full-time master of DOM. That's Welcome good. both. Uh, just in case anyone thinks I was being rude to you there, Brownie, um, amateur philosopher and master of DOM is your own description. Can you explain it? Uh, I'm sure my mum can back up many a story, <laughs> but I've always been done. If you're going to be dumb, you've got to be tough. Yeah. <laughs> um, just 
I like to think Very deeply about a lot of things. I think a lot of artists do, a lot of creatives certainly do. I think that's their impetus for having any creative output in the first place. Um, and I reckon now is the time to be thinking about a lot of things, especially a lot of subjects we're talking about tonight, about mental health and things like that. Uh -huh. it's good to have discussions, philosophers talk about things a lot. And I think open discussion is something that we really need to be having. Cool. Um, just to let people know you're in a working tattoo uh, salon at the moment. King's Cross Tattoo Parlour in the centre of London. Yes, I wow. am. Yeah, yeah great, great crew. It's our second day of guesting here. Busy street shop. Everybody's amazing. Full on talent. That's okay, awesome. cool. Great. Uh <laughs> at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> so, Becky, we're going to start with you um, tonight. You're an evolution psychologist. Yes, I Can am. Can you elaborate on what that is? Because everybody's so interested. And then tell us about the study of psychology and how that relates to tattooing. I can. Um, do you want me to use slides? Will we? Point? Yeah, Shahira, if uh, you could bring up Becky's slides for us, please. Great stuff. Do you want to do my other RCA? Um, oh, sorry, Pete, could you just mute there for a sec while? Sorry. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. So, essentially, um, when we're looking at psychology, we generally take one or multiple five different perspectives whenever it is we're looking at psychology and these are the five core areas specified by the British Psychological Society and that's them up on the slide there so you've got biological psychology individual differences cognitive psychology social psychology developmental psychology but evolutionary psychology kind of underpins all of this it comes beneath all of that so you can take an evolutionary biological perspective an evolutionary individual differences perspective Ultimately, evolutionary psychology considers how we evolved, the environment that we evolved, um, and looks at a number of different right, anything that you, you're considering, really, to consider, you know, how this behavior either helped or hindered our survival or reproduction, essentially. Um, so it takes an adaptationist perspective, even though we know that not everything we're looking at is necessarily adaptive, so it didn't necessarily always help survival or reproduction or either of those it might have just piggybacked on on the back of something else um so in an in a very brief nutshell that's what evolutionary psychology is um, so if you want to flip onto the next slide um this was borrowed wait this is from nico tinberg and so he's in he was an, a famous ethologist or a very well-known ethologist, should I say. And he said that in order to understand any behavior, you need to be able to explain it from these four different perspectives here. Two of these are what we call proximate explanations, and that's the mechanism and the development. So we're looking at the immediate trigger for a specific behavior and the development in somebody's lifetime, you know, so things that you've grown up with and, or, you know, a change in culture over the time you've grown up or something. The bottom two ones are what we call ultimate perspectives, and these are looking at the development of behaviours from a longer period than just your own individual lifetime. So the phylogeny of behaviour, we might look at how behaviour is developed by looking at, you know, different um, animal species. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, we sometimes bring in cross-cultural evidence to look at this as well. And the function is the evolutionary function. So did it help survival or reproduction in very brief terms? So we can apply those things to tattooing. Um, if we want to flip on to the, the next slide. Um, so there's just some examples of how we might apply this to looking at tattooing. So what was it that directly triggered someone going into a specific shop, tattooing shop, um, mm -hmm. contacting a specific artist? Was it things like social acceptance? Is it things like deviance? Is it about conformity? Is it just something about opportunity? So what was it that directly kicked someone up the butt to go and do that? Mm -hmm. Um, what about your own development? So what's the, been the impact of, say, the attitudes of your caregivers when you've been growing up? Um, were you ever influenced by, like, I don't know, your favourite artists, music artists or anything as you were growing up in terms of tattooing and their tattooing and their image and things like that? And how's this impacted on your motivation for getting tattooed or not getting tattooed? 
um, the phylogeny of this, so a phylogenetic perspective, you know, obviously we, we don't see animals getting tattooed and stuff, but we do sometimes see animals using different kinds of sort of adornment behaviours to, you know, affiliate with different groups. Mm -hmm. um, oh, again, we, we can bring in cross-cultural research here and look at tattooing in, in other cultures and other traditions. Mm -hmm. And again, the function has tattooing or did it help the survival or reproduction of our ancestors, essentially. So in a nutshell, that's what evolutionary psychology is. And that's the kind of perspective that I go with in terms of tattooing. OK, so you're looking back on histories and our motivations for doing yeah. things and our behaviours. Um, so things that sort of trigger or trigger our innate impulses and mm -hmm. obviously one of them so many of us like to get tattoos some yep. people don't um have those motivations i mean when when you listen to someone like uh matt lauder for instance yeah. and see how long and and how many of us have always been getting tattooed mm -hmm. getting the same motifs done for lots of the same reasons have our motivations for have they changed very much no in a nutshell no um i think i think this kind of dominant narrative that people say about you know looking at tattooed people as taking risks or um as as being mentally unwell or having you know a psychopathology kind of thing i think this is probably a very brief moment in history that we've actually had this perspective but to us it's kind of all we've known we've grown up with that kind of perspective you know so i know matt lauder says about prior to the war tattooing was really common among the upper classes and it was only really after the war that once um you know changes in the work environments and things tattoos were then on display and it became associated with the lower classes so it shifted this cultural perspective and then all of a sudden we start looking at you know oh well why would people put themselves through all that pain and that process there must be something wrong with them they're clearly risk taken because it's a form of self-injury and you know actually if you look beyond that if you look before that mm -hmm. and beyond just the western culture yeah it's not the motivations have very much stayed the same yeah that, i mean that's what keeps coming back from the ones i did last year on yeah the histories and stuff that's the thing that keeps slapping and even when you look at some of the research that's and papers and studies that are done now like online when i look at them it's some of the stuff still very old hat like oh, they're still saying the same things definitely um, i haven't it, really caught up <laughs> exactly it, a lot of it does seem very misinformed definitely um identification Mm -hmm. I think, do we need another slide for this one? Yes, we can skip on to the next one. So as I, so I've, I've outlined there briefly about, you know, evolutionary psychology. So just mm -hmm. essentially what we're looking at in evolutionary psychology, are these innate motivations that we might have. Um, and a lot of this, you know, rather than conscious consideration of something, um, a lot of these motivations might be to blend in or to stand out and I know that that seems really counterintuitive and I'll try and explain it a little bit more um but one of the examples of this is sort of fashion um so you know and I'm sure it was you know this isn't very long ago David Beckham when he unveiled his his sleeve you know with kind of <laughs> you know some religious bits in there and some script and then this sort of cloud background bringing it all together um and it wasn't very long after he did that that a lot of people went out and kind of copied it. Didn't get the exact same tattoo, mm. thankfully, but it was very much the same style. So if you if you flip onto the next slide, you can just see some random examples of this. Just you can see it's very much the same style, and it was it's very like it epitomizes that point in time. Yeah. Um, really now you know so at that time it was really new and really fresh, and now you look back at it and it kind of you know where it's come from. You you, you can kind of picture the time frame and the motivations behind it so there's a number of things going on with this and you know David Beckham really you know handsome and um, successful mm -hmm. popular and he all of a sudden comes out with this thing and it, it's socially it's socially acceptable people go along to emulate him and assure that you know try and identify as part of his in-group essentially um, so again see this similarity 
but also these individual differences where you, you kind of banded together as part of this group or wanting to be part of this group, but you can see all these individual differences among the, 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 um, the actual production of the, of the piece. Yeah. So blending in, but standing out as well. Yeah, I mean, you can see it because, um, like I said, it becomes if somebody that well known and, and loved and yeah, sports person as well, get something like that, then it becomes more socially acceptable. Yeah, You're exactly. Like, oh, he's got it done. That's okay. Exactly. Yeah. And you see it with a lot. I mean, you know, way back when, when little Mark Owen and take that had his dolphin tattoo and everyone got <laughs> went out and got that as well because it was cute and it was socially acceptable. Um so you, you see it kind of ebb and flow over time as well. Um, when you were talking about other cultures there and in and out groups and mm -hmm. reproductive benefits, can you explain that bit for us? Yes. So if we go on to the next slide there. So this is um, or this is a few examples, really, from um, essentially the same thing as what we've just seen with David Beckham there but it looks different because it is relevant to different cultures and tribes right. so what we what we're showing here is identification and belonging with an individual group or tribe or culture and to us you know if we saw a group of any one of these people they would probably all look the same and these these modifications look quite extreme because mm -hmm. it's not something that we typically see in our culture yeah. but within each of those groups you become sensitive to the individual differences with with what's going on so you might look at you know how well it's healed how symmetrical it is and things like that and that's something that's really important for a lot of traditional um cultures and tribes so something that we often see with modifications in men is that they're done in a way that highlights their genetic fitness. So it shows how much of a good mate they would be, how much of a formidable rival they would be. And part of that's the symmetry in it. So you can see the, the, the guy on the bottom there really highlights the symmetry. Mm -hmm. um, and because of how well it's healed, it amplifies that symmetry even more. So you know that you know it, it can be quite hard sometimes for tattooing to heal well. Mm -hmm. um, especially in the kind of conditions that it might be done in some in some non-Western cultures as well. Um, so, you know, prone to infection, it's often not very sanitized conditions. You might be using different kinds of needles, inks, well, inks would be a looser term, I guess, pigment, you know, things like ash and bark and coal and things like that would be rubbed <laughs> in instead. Mm -hmm. um, and for the women, a lot of the time, tattoos, um, will show their femininity in terms of whether they've reached womanhood, whether they are reproductively available, whether they are fertile. Mm -hmm. um, and these modifications will often make them more attractive to those within their group. So the lady with the stretched nose holes, often the bigger, the better it, within that tribe, but mm -hmm. to alternative tribes, to other tribes, the out group, they're perceived as really unattractive. So it serves as this double kind of function of preventing the women from being taken by oh. other tribes and things like that as well. So you can see a lot of the ties with survival and reproduction that underlie these motives. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I mean, they're really interesting. And again, it's like, it's uh, when we get on to uh, brownie and, and facial and very visible tattoos yeah. that people uh, can be quite shocked at because it's right, yeah. in, like, right in your face. Um, and, <laughs> and people have strong reactions to it. So it doesn't like we look at this here uh, and these people here and we think, OK, so that's sort of tribal, it's cultural. But yeah, um, when you see someone walking down the street and they've got a facial tattoo, people are still a little bit like, ooh. You know, yeah. the reaction can be strong or not, you know. Yeah. Um, the in in the West, we have the same. I mean, actually, sorry, going back to the reproduction part, mm -hmm. um, I think you, uh, there are some pictures here as well. But like when you were saying it depends on where someone has the tattoo as well, if they look. Yes. And it studies John. Yeah, I think that's I don't think I have the those pictures on ah. there. But so what we what we often see is that tattoos will amplify things that we've identified 
as being attractive from an evolutionary perspective. So again, it's not something that you, you consciously think, at, oh, look at the, you know, the shoulder to waist ratio on that guy, it's really attractive, or the waist to hip ratio on that woman, it's lovely. But yeah. um, unconsciously, it is something that we perceive as more or less attractive. So we know that the, the waist to hip ratio for women, the ideal is, is about 0.7. Um, I think the, the shoulder to, to waist for men, I think is 0.9 or yeah, point nine, I think. Um, and often tattoos will be put on on those places. Um, and the idea is that it, it amplifies, uh, or it, it draws your attention to those areas. So it might draw attention to the waist and the hips of women. Um, so, you, you know, the, the lower back um, tattoo was popular for, for a long time with women. The under boob ones, um, I don't know if they're still popular but that didn't seem like very long ago that they were really all popular and yeah. um, for men the arms and um, the chest as well so really amplifying kind of muscular tone upper body strength for men and waist to hip ratio which is important in looking at indicators of fertility in women yeah because it was it was interesting I remember um when you uh, hearing you talk before and you had a picture of a guy same guy and with the tattoo on his shoulder and without and people just thought the the one with the he looked better and bigger or something yeah. in the one where he had his his shoulder tattoo yeah, which is weird because it's the same guy it's yeah exactly that's one of my favorite um studies that was done and it was done just a few years ago um and what they did they had like a series of you know topless men from from just the torso up to the head really and they superimposed or photoshopped mm -hmm. on like a, just a little spiky tribal tattoo on on his arm and he didn't have any other tattoos um and they were rated by men and women in terms of how attractive healthy um you know how masculine he was and things mm -hmm. like that and men actually perceived him as a great arrival um and some someone to be more feared of because he had the one with the tattoo and um the women perceived him as healthier wow. um which was quite interesting Very so interesting yeah such a nice little study but like so clear cut as well it's really good well yeah and a very telling of our own perceptions of Absolutely. people uh, and what people wear and their skins and the fashion of the times as well yeah definitely um in in the west um the in groups and out groups do they differ very much i mean uh, compared to what well, what you were talking about there we're still looking for we still define ourselves by what we wear maybe how we look what we're into to yeah. define the kind of groups we're in yeah and i think i am um, i think you know in, in a lot of smaller tribes and um, the differences might not be so great or, or should I say the variation might not be so great or it might be just different to what we see but whereas we're looking at it we see you know we've, we're obviously a much bigger society than what we've evolved in and a lot of um, these smaller tribes that we see in in other parts of the world um, and there's a lot of variation in what can be classed as our in-group and out-group so it might be on things like experiences that you've had or haven't had um, courses that you study in things that you're interested in like tattooing um, your favorite tv programs music <laughs> you know and it's it sometimes for, for in western societies tattoos can just be you know a real indicator of that that person's got a tattoo that i understand and i want to go and talk to that person some more or it might be that person's got a tattoo that i understand and i really want to avoid that person so yeah. you know if someone had um i don't know the, the little marco and dolphin or something you might be like you know running away from them or you might be like i'm gonna take that fan as well and you want to go and talk to them some more um so it can really highlight your in group and out group in that sense and sort of either open a dialogue for for more communication and getting to know each other or shut it down before it starts right it's kind of like a, an almost it's an immediate indicator if you know to someone as well like you're showing stuff like i remember yeah. um when I had uh, on the first episode, uh, we had Tarangi, um, Tarangi to Natana and he does Tomoko and he was saying about the tattoos, all of the tattoos that he does, that they, that it's basically like wearing your soul on your yeah. skin. For yeah, him. exactly. Um, and, and somebody I, can read you almost, they can read you, they can tell some of your story if they yeah. know how to uh, by that. So that's yeah. It. 
that's it it's if you know how to um there's a i have got a couple of pictures later on where it's like it kind of shows that actually if you want to skip forward two slides um so some of those things there are quite easy to read i think and it might indicate something about the wearer of these tattoos or the owner of these tattoos and um, if you don't recognize those images then it might not and it might not mean anything to you and i know you know the middle one that's that's my best friend it's, it's on his leg and he made a kid cry when he was out in a pair of shorts <laughs> um, <so laughs> um but if you have a look on the following slide um these ones are maybe a little bit more abstract and some of uh -huh. these some people might not be able to read these or understand what these are mm -hmm. but for for the sort of select few who do recognize these symbols or what they are mm -hmm. then it's something that might be very um prominent and um, very meaningful to people um so you know you've got um I'm, starting to use my mouse to highlight it <laughs> like i would in a lecture and um, so the first one is um it's a semicolon and mm -hmm. it's associated with mental health and illness mm -hmm. and it's a sign that somebody could have ended their sentence but didn't so obviously there's you know the metaphor there with with grammar and with suicide yeah and um, the middle one what is the name of that middle one again um at the iron heart is it? fire rose unity um and it is a symbol of being a survivor of sexual assault okay. and then the, the final one is a mastectomy tattoo so you know someone who's had to have a mastectomy and um, to recover from cancer and it's you know something that's obviously very very close to closely tied with femininity and oftentimes um someone's identity as well as being painfully and psychologically difficult traumatic yeah. Yeah. um and so sometimes for some people taking ownership of their body you get retaken ownership of their body after something like that and tattoo in that area really kind of helps them to reconnect with their body again um and helps with psychological healing really yeah i mean that's i think the last one there especially is really beautiful um it is and like you said i mean i've read some studies um on therapeutic nature of tattooing that said like a lot of women as you said following a mastectomy they can often perceive their bodies as like a totally new body a foreign body a strange one yeah. and maybe seen as less than ideal so like by by getting a tattoo and replacing that they've got something new and their bodies like you said they can reclaim it and can look at something so it's kind of like a new beauty on their terms that's maybe. right yeah that's right yeah um is is that something you've come across in other areas um like of our bodies that have been physically or emotionally altered or for sure like yeah so for, for a number of different perspectives as well so we know that some people can use tattooing in a very negative way so to claim ownership over somebody by forcefully tattooing somebody oh. um but likewise we you know some people use tattooing as a way of helping to recover like like these people have here um, and it can be you know to indicate surviving um from traumatic experiences a number of traumatic experiences of childhood abuse um, and again we see celebrity affiliation with this as well um doing the same kind of um things so i think demi lovato had survivor tattooed somewhere around here i think and um, lady gaga's got the same one that's in the middle there um, so again, showing really identifying kind of social acceptability as well as in group and this sort of, for want of a better word, camaraderie, like um, we can survive this together kind of thing, you know. Um, and also we see a lot, of, you know, um, tattoos being used as memorials as well. Mm -hmm. And there is there is a, a real, there's a psychological literature around using tattoos as a way of continuing bonds with with someone who's passed definitely um the addictive nature of tattoos yeah. some of the like people who like to get more than one a lot like to cover their body um is the process do you think is the process as much part of it as the aesthetics are and um, if you want to flip on to the next slide um not that that is very meaningful at this point but um 
So one thing I often get asked about is whether tattoos are addictive. So physically, um, not so much. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but for some people, there is there is a process where, and it's still not addiction, but it's more about putting your body through its paces and seeing what it's capable of. So if, if any of you have ever heard of the Brutal Black Project, um, it's, it's some, you know, I mean, I'm sure Brownie can kind of highlight this a bit more, but tattooing can be done really rough or it can be much more gentle. And in this, in the Brutal Black Project, people are forcefully, not forcefully, but purposefully rough, roughly tattooed and people volunteer for it. And they're kind of forced almost to put up with it. Um, but that's what they want to do. And it's, it's all part of really seeing how far their bodies can go. But in terms of actual addiction, it's not recognized as an addiction or anything. And I don't, I, I don't see how it could be classed as addictive yeah. either. Okay. Um, in, in... Sorry, Elmer, if yeah, I could just, um, yeah. uh, I actually tattooed an addiction psychologist today. Which <laughs> really? Uh, and we were talking about tattoos as an addiction. And he was saying that uh, two of the main criteria for an actual addiction are tolerance, which you'll find if people get tattooed regularly, they do have a much higher tolerance for being able to sit for longer hours, Mm. uh, but also for withdrawal. And I don't think people really get withdrawal from tattooing. You know, you might miss it a lot, but it's not like you're craving to go out and get tattooed. I think the the addiction is maybe the wrong word. People do get obsessed with getting tattooed. Obsessed, right. Better words. They plan out who they're going to go to. They save Mm. up a lot of money. They travel long, like the guy that came and got tattooed today, travelled from Wales to London to get tattooed. Wow. And I know people that have travelled internationally to do it. So oh, yeah. Yeah. it might not necessarily be an addiction, but surely a strong obsession. Yeah. It, it can very much be an obsession, absolutely. So if you if you look at things like, um, you know, there's different diagnostic criteria for addiction and tattooing doesn't seem to really fit in that for all the reasons Brownie's just outlined there. Yeah. Um, it does release... Um, like adrenaline and things like that um, and, it, and it can induce like a euphoric kind of feeling associated with fight or flight but to say that that would be addictive in the same way as like substance use or compulsive behaviors would be kind of misleading yeah and some people can think is it the social aspect so you know um get, getting attention and people asking you questions and that but you know for as I mentioned earlier you know for, for a large part of the last century tattooing was really looked down on it just innately looked down on so th- these are a couple of the the bits that I use in in the talks that I do at, at our place some of these kind of perspectives on on tattooed people and how incompetent we are how damaged we are how stupid we are and there is some some research that shows that men think like um, tattooed women are, are more sexually available the non-tattooed women more promiscuous and um, tattooed men are more likely to be right and women drug addicts mm-hmm. criminals in prison and things like that part of that is just an artifact of the really um misinformed literature that we've had that you, you mentioned earlier and um, some of the research that I've done you know I went back in, uh, into the psychological literature as far back as I could go um and it's just innately is presented as a psychopathology or a deviance there's no question about it there's no there's no argument as to why it's just there it's just inbuilt in it um it's 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 also perpetuated by the media because like mm -hmm. i mean as far back as matt could get um uh, p- newspaper articles and like I went back and researched myself and like even you know in the 90s 20 you know in 2000s yeah. and you get still people talking about the media talking about it in in that kind of way you know that yeah. the deviants are and and that it's like lower class or the way as you said like um I had a tattoo artist on last year um uh Gemma she she was on and she used to work in a pub as well and she's like heavily tattooed and she said like a lot of men thought they felt like they could grab her or touch her because she had because she was heavily tattooed yeah Um, definitely so that's again the perception of other people which you have to put up with I guess Uh, (laughs) um but it'd be nice to educate people that so that they didn't have that uh exactly (laughs) yeah um before we get on to, to Brownie, um, just a little bit, 
like you were just talking there about the bias. Um, do you think, I mean, it has changed because so many people have tattoos now and it is more socially acceptable, but there still, there still is some bias against people who have tattoos. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it wasn't, it, it wasn't long ago when, you know, the, the, prevailing attitudes where women couldn't have chest pieces they couldn't have full sleeves they would never get a job and it's too manly to have that kind of tattooing and it was only a few years later that that become really quite commonplace yes in in a, as, as well with hand tattoos you know they're often called job stoppers because if you had visible tattoos you obviously could never get a job <laughs> but now you see hand tattoos face tattoos neck tattoos a lot more so um and I think sometimes there is still um, a role of social acceptability here. So we see some t um, famous people um, or high profile people with some aspects of these tattoos and that makes it all right all of a sudden. And mm -hmm. so people with those kind of tattoos, uh, um, I guess, maybe less of a shock to people, you know, out and about, whereas people with different tattoos that are visible, mm -hmm. I mean, I still get you know comments about why have you got a black arm and things like that and you're like I, I don't even know what to say to that to be honest <laughs> but, to yeah yeah exactly why have you not got a black arm <laughs> yeah I mean just on the last question as a um as a lecturer yourself in Sunderland when your students rock in I mean see you uh, as you are with lots of tattoos neck tattoos do you get a good reaction um, to be honest, I'm really rubbish at noticing um, <laughs> positive or negative actions, <laughs> reactions to us. Um, my husband notices a lot more than I do. I hope it makes us more approachable and I hope it makes people see that, um, you know, you, you can still do academia or whatever when, with, with tattoo and it's not it's not just that you're on the scrap heap as soon as you get a tattoo or something like we're kind of met, led to believe when we were younger and, and things like that. Um, well, so I hope so. Yeah, I mean, before, like, you may not like the look of old scraggy guys with white beards and things, and that's who taught you before, maybe. Exactly. So, no. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, depends on what you like. Uh, exactly. Thanks, Becky. Uh, let's go over no to problem. Pete. Um, sorry, Brownie tattoo artist um first of all how did you get into tattooing i know you've been tattooing for many years i've been tattooing for coming up to 18 years now mm -hmm. um, i really fell into it when i got into it it wasn't the legit career option that it is now yeah i think you know the boom in social media and people being able to see the best artwork in the world has really inspired a lot of creatives to take it up straight off the bat uh, i fell into it because I needed to get a job after college. I got taught how to pierce. Uh, I loved working with inside the industry, but I hated the studio I was working in. And then I moved on to working in a biker tattoo studio where it was still very much just pick the flash off the walls. I mean, we've got some lovely hand-drawn designs here, mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't like that back in the day. It would normally be a rack of the same designs that you'd be able to pick out of any studio that you walk into. Mm -hmm. And that was how it had always been. Um, I've always drawn, so when I started working there, I started drawing designs for the guy. And then one day we had a no-show, and he was like, why don't you give it a go yourself? So I spent a few hours butchering a foot that didn't go well. <laughs> and then I spent six months after that, you know, bullying my friends and my brother into getting tattooed. Um, and just kind of took it from there, really. I, I didn't have an apprenticeship as such. The guy that I was working for broke both his forearms within six months of me working at the shop. And his silent partner showed up on my doorstep being like, you either start tattooing or we shut the shop. Okay. So that was that. <laughs> I did about a year's worth of small tribal stars and names. And yeah, I've just taken it from there. It, it wasn't the best start in it, for sure. And um, I see people come into it now. <coughs> Sorry, we've got some sirens going past. That's, That's the centre of London for you. It's London, yeah. Um, yeah, you get people coming into it now. And within five minutes, they are incredible artists. But I, again, I think that it's because it's more prevalent people get to see it and i think it goes back to some of what you were just saying to rebecca there as well people's mm -hmm. attitudes are changing towards mm -hmm. tattooing it's mm -hmm. way more commonplace to see visible tattoos these days yeah um, and it's not uncommon for people to come in and want to get their hands on their neck or even their face done as their first tattoo and there are artists out there doing it you know yeah 
yeah. it's, it's a good thing that maybe some of the mysticism from tattooing has been removed over the years. Um, but, you know, with it being more commonplace, maybe it's lost some of the respect for it that we should have. Right, right. Um, you've tattooed in America and Europe and all over the UK. Does it differ much or do tattooing communities have a commonality that you could maybe pinpoint for us? I think from tattooing inside the UK, um, we tend to pick up a lot of the states. You know, it, it's always been very backstreet um, and, and not well received. People just want to get the most amount of work that they can for the small amount of money. Mm. Um, but since it's been turned into a, a legit art form, you know, people are picking that up. And uh, yeah, definitely over the last five years, we've seen a huge change. Maybe not so much internationally, styles and attitudes might vary, but yeah. the boom in tattooing is undeniable. You know, within the last five to 10 years, it's a completely different world. And I think because we are much more of a united community globally now, Mm -hmm. that's you know seen everywhere brilliant i mean that's that's got to be a good thing as well i mean the ease and like the platforms and things that people have social media to put things out so you can pick yep. and choose who's good who's reputable and and yeah it's I mean, a bit of a double-edged sword you know everybody wants to get into it being good uh, okay. and everybody wants to be covered in tattoos these days not everybody realizes that you can't go to the same guy for every style of artwork. And mm -hmm. the guy at the end of your road might be easy to get to, but he might not necessarily be the best person to give you the tattoo that you want. Yeah, true. Describe your style for us. Um, and where does your influence, or where do your influences come from? These days I'm primarily a lettering artist. Uh, mm -hmm. I specialize in fine line script or beveled old English, um, modern calligraphy as well. Um, my influence is, I, I started calligraphy when I was about eight years old. My mum put a calligraphy pen in my hand. Right. He was practicing writing very neat letters and I just followed suit. Unfortunately, it wasn't something that I maintained for that yeah. long. Um, but it's, when I got into it, it was the fashion to have your name in Old English, your own name in Old English down the middle of your forearm. Oh. So I probably did a few of those a week and hated it every time. Um, and it was only after trying several different styles of tattooing and never really feeling like that I was creating something for myself that I came back round to tattooing, lettering and really enjoyed it. Does some of the, the um, <clears throat> thanks for putting that up, Shahira, we'll come to that in a sec, um, but is some of it also like influenced by hip hop because a lot of the ones that we're going to see, but it reminds me of sort of a lot of the early hip-hop style yeah sure i mean i think that goes to what we were saying about people liking to celebrate the things that they're into and the mm -hmm. things that they feel unite them with other people you know music especially if you're into the same music as somebody else it gives you common ground and if you've got a like uh the pma one above the guy's eyebrow is a song title from band uh, h2o Oh, and yeah. you know if you recognize that that's an instant talking point isn't it so it you know people like to put the, on them the things that they're into and like we were saying if you know how to read it if you recognize it you understand that that's your tribe very easily right you you're a freehand tattooist and um, for those of, of of us are that don't know about tattooing can you explain the difference and why do you think this method kind of creates a more unique experience for the wearer of the tattoo? Sure. I mean, I prefer to freehand my artwork because it fits better on the body. Taking a 2D image and placing it on a 3D surface often warps it. And I think, okay. you know, if you take a look at the, the shin I've done there, might not necessarily be straight. It's kind of an optical illusion. It looks straight. And yeah. I feel like that, from a technical standpoint, is why I freehand. But also, um, it gives people more of a, a feeling that they're getting something uniquely theirs. You know, it's not anything that I'd be able to replicate again. Even if I did try and draw the same thing, it's not going to be the same. And like, I wouldn't try and draw the same thing again. But if it's from a flashbook, kind of unspoken rule in tattooing, you can repeat that image. And I think these days people want something that they know is their own, especially if they're emotionally tied to the tattoo. And a lot of the work that I do 
is like that. You know, not every single one of them. Yeah. Um, but a lot of them are people that have passed on or, you know, getting themselves over a trialing time. Well, let's have a, a look at that. You've said you want to use your art uh, to raise awareness of modern issues. Um, and can we, can, well, can you elaborate on this and how it shapes your work? Sure. Like, what was the impetus for it as well? I know there's about three questions there, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the impetus for that really spun out of the pandemic and the lockdown. Um, I've been personally affected by suicide before and a lot of my close circle have it just seems that within the last few years that's become rife yeah I find it very hard to visit an area that I haven't been in a while without hearing about two or three guys that have done that and I know it's not uniquely a male thing suicide in general seems to be mad at the moment mm. but it just seems that men suffer more from it because there's this attitude that if they are talking about their mental health they're somehow less masculine mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and i think the the tattoo that we've got up there that sam piece is a really good example of this that was a customer who you know he's a jiu-jitsu coach really masculine guy fit to look at him you would find him not intimidating but you can see that he's fit and healthy looks after yeah. himself a classic male yeah um, but while I was drawing on him and while he was sitting and getting the tattoo, the reasons behind it came out. And it was, that was his son that had died of a cot death. Um, and he, you know, he welled up and got emotional while we were talking about it. He wasn't falling. It wasn't dramatic. You could just see he was very influenced by the emotions going on inside him at the time. Hmm. And to me, that is not uh, an unmasculine thing. Being able to show your emotions like that is great you know that should be revered and not put down exactly and I think through tattooing or through artwork is you know <laughs> as we've said before tattoos are a talking point you know, they're not necessarily always the best talking point and it's not always the appropriate time to be talking about it mm -hmm. like Rebecca saying people coming up and asking her why she's got a black arm <laughs> I'm also in the black arm crew I've got two black legs <laughs> um, but you know, I think it's quite a brave move to be able to put something out there on the body that you know you're going to be asked about. And maybe that is people working through their own recovery for it. You know what's interesting as well, like you were saying that, and then it gradually came out. I heard this guy recently, he's a barber, and he was on a radio program, and he found, like, he has been fighting as well, like, while he's barbering cutting hair shaving and stuff that yeah. people were would talk that men would talk start to talk about yeah. their feelings and he said it's like uh, men need to be doing something to be yeah. able to talk so they need to be doing something so that then they can talk about it rather than just like women could just sit down and just like la 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 yeah i think the women definitely have the edge on us there because there's no stigma about them just opening up one to one with a friend and they're very good at it um the addiction psychologist that I was speaking to DC actually made a really interesting point that it almost seems to be that men need to be in a group that reflects their social uh, like if you're in a pub you're more likely to open up about things if you're in a group at a barbershop you know how many people go on a Saturday and find themselves involved in like conversation that they wouldn't get into normally um. I personally found a lot that and I think any other tattoo artist would stay the same <laughs> People love to spill their problems to you while they're getting tattooed. Mm. Um, you know, sometimes it's not the appropriate time, but other times if it's quiet and the person is respectful of the area that they're in, for sure. Like if they feel like they can open up, then that's all the better. Yeah. Um, I just think that we maybe need to reassess how we look at why they're getting into those situations. Um, some of the artwork that I provided for you mm -hmm. as examples of my work are for people that are creating groups now for young men to be able to come forward in a safe, unjudgmental area and to be able to talk about not all the negative things, but just things that are going on in their life. Yeah. You know, it, everybody needs that pressure relief at some point. Like a safe space or a space that they feel comfortable in that is, allows that to happen if, yeah. if, it, if they want it. Yes. Yeah. Um, as it, yeah, we can look at the next one, please, Shahira. Um, 
this one it's uh the one you mentioned earlier yeah pma positive mental attitude like i yeah do you want to tell us about this one uh so again uh this client got it because he's very into the band um but i think that is just a great statement to be having isn't it like it's so easy to get caught up in the negativity of things. I think, especially in England, we love to complain about stuff. So having a constant reminder to stay positive is brilliant. And people get to read that off his face straight away. If you understand what it means, it's pretty heavy hitting. Um, as a tattooist, how do you approach like creating and working with someone who is dealing with loss or addiction or suicide, self-harm and yeah. wants a tattoo, perhaps to acknowledge the pain or their story or their journey? Yeah, I think you have to gauge it very individually. You know, there have been a lot of times where I've been asked for something that would be a reminder of somebody or a traumatic event. And perhaps it's not the right thing for them to be carrying a constant reminder of it on their body. Mm -hmm. But what I do find is that when people come and say, let's use the example of getting the name of a loved one that's passed, you know, they've already processed it in their own head to the point where they feel like they want to move on. And maybe getting that tattoo is the start of something fresh. Um, I also, I said to you in our emails that there was that book, Pagan Fleshworks. It came out in 2000 and it's uh, the alchemy of body modification and how getting a tattoo and taking that time out of your normal routine to look after it also means that you're taking time out of your routine to look after yourself mm -hmm. and that is something that a lot of us ignore yeah tattooists That's in general you know i know we rush into the studio in the morning we're terrible for not eating throughout the day and then we guzzle everything at night yeah, if you have something that is a reminder, immediate reminder, that you do need to take a break from that, to take a step back, reevaluate things and get yourself together, it's great. Um, can we see the next um, one? Yeah, um, Memento Mori. So like this Mori. again, it's, uh, Mori, it's like a reoccurring theme um, across the, the centuries that people like to get something that reminds them of this one is yeah a uh, memento mori is remember you will die um which seems quite negative but i think it's a common thing that the beauty of life is that it doesn't last you know you'll never be as young or as good looking as you will today and life is all the more beautiful because it's it's going to end uh, i particularly like this one because it's remember you will die but first remember you'll live and you know, we do need a bit of a reminder to do that every now and then. You know, take a break out of your routine, do something that you enjoy, go and get a tattoo or anything. You know, People yeah. are so heavy on themselves sometimes, it's a good reminder that it's okay to take a break. And actually the point you made before that as well, it's uh, excellent. I think everybody needs to remind it because we don't. We sometimes we're so busy in our lives, especially yep. these days, like people are working more than ever, harder than ever, you know, bills to pay. And, and this, right. uh, the last, the lockdown as well, it's been quite yeah. suffocating for a lot of people. So um, that thing to look after ourselves, um, and we're not really taught to do that. It's like, if you do, you're somehow selfish, but actually it's the first thing we need to do, look, is yeah. look after ourselves. Yeah. Um, uh, can we see the next one as well? So there's, I mean, lots of different things that people can, can put on their bodies, but like there's yeah. lots of reasons for doing it. I mean, victims of sexual violence as we're, as Becky said, I mean, skin yeah. conditions like uh, vitiligo, where people have done it as well. Um, this one, this is big, this is bold. What's this one? Yeah. Uh, this is Alba Grobra, which is Scotland forever. You know, so she's celebrating where she comes from. Uh, the one that I did today was Cymru, which is Wales. Yeah, again, it's people celebrating their tribalism, celebrating things that unite them. Um, we are very tribalistic in nature, even though we like to think we've moved past that. You know, a lot of what Rebecca was saying reminds us that, you know, this is a snapshot of a very big piece of history. And I don't think there's been any race of man that doesn't tattoo themselves or modify their bodies in some way mm -hmm. to put ownership on it. And the things that we tend to do it with have previously been tribal symbols or religious iconography. Yeah. Um, 
the things that we celebrate and that has now bled into music and things like that yeah there was um i read about this guy as well uh, a tattooist in dublin called sean kelly and he started his friend um wasn't able to get a job or didn't go for a job because he had like lots of marks from self-harm so yeah. on his arms and so he the, the job required him to wear like short sleeves and then his yeah. friends said like why don't I just tattoo over them and it gave him the sort of thought that like more people should could do this and it yeah. like again going back to reclaiming things so I personally um you know I've covered up a lot of self-harm scars I know most tattooists have and I think it's like the mastectomy photo from the previous slides. What a beautiful way of getting over something that could be quite traumatic, you know, reclaiming your femininity and your womanhood by getting something that you're keen to show off. Probably not your breasts every day, but yeah. you know, in certain situations, <laughs> getting a tattoo can really change somebody's positive, like outlook on their body in a positive way. Um, I certainly used it growing up to you know, not get over anything, but I use tattooing and body modification as a way of discovering my own limits. I was born with cystic fibrosis. I spent a lot of time in a hospital growing up. I was told that I would always have limits. And, you know, I was like, I'll show you. <laughs> uh, so I got tattooed early. I've got scarification. I've got implants. I've done suspension. And it's always been, in my eyes, a positive thing of thinking this meat suit that we get to walk around in it can be viewed as so fragile but actually it's hugely resistant and strong have you have you ever come across uh, bob flanagan he had cystic fibrosis and he's um he's a, uh, an artist but he sort of did everything on his body himself and a lot of stuff he's a really interesting guy and he was at one stage i think it's like i read about him in the 90s um okay. but he's like what he was the uh, same as you he's told like that he wouldn't have that long limitations and everything and yeah. he outlived all of those things that from yeah. doing this from doing things to his body using it as something to sort of like oh two fingers to you cystic fibrosis i'm gonna yeah 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 um i can relate to that Right. <clears throat> um, can we see another one? Um, when you do a, a piece of artwork, are they? Oh, this is before that. This is great. I love this. Um, tell us about this one. Uh, so this is a recovering addict who uh, had just gone through a relapse. Um, and rather than looking at it as, you know, all that hard work has gone out the window, she was using this tattoo to just claim that part of her personality. You know, the biggest step in recovery, we all know, is admitting that you've got a problem um, and putting it out there. She didn't really have a lot of other tattoos. So to have that in such a prominent place, that will be a talking point for her. I thought that was a, a brave move for her to do. You know, she knows she's going to have to go over and over that story of why she's got it. Um, and it was she wanted to talk about it. Not a lot of people do want to talk about the worst parts of their own nature, but I know from personal experience that being able to open up and talk about things is instantly uplifting. You know, it, it can totally be the hardest thing to do, especially talking to people in your own circle. Um, but I found that when you can open up, you often find that people can relate in way more of a personal nature than you had expected. Yeah, I mean, it's the, the initial starting of it that's often hard. Um, and also, once you voice something, once you've given voice to it, it's like it's out, it's out yeah. there. And it helps yeah. to sort of relieve it and lift it. Um, what We're just looking at, you also do uh, pieces of artwork uh, outside of putting them on people's skin. Um, mm -hmm. Are they, do you generally get commissioned or is it something that you just get uh, like inspired by? So doing that professionally is something very new for me. Um, mm -hmm. I was taking commissions for paintings while I couldn't tattoo during the pandemic. Okay. Uh, and that was the impetus for uh, using art outside of my tattooing to support the platforms that I want. Uh, if we skip back a okay. couple, sorry, yeah. if we go back to the one where the person hanging the, that one, one more, flip one more to the guy holding up the canvas. Yeah, that one. This, yeah, so this one, it's not immediately obvious just from the words, but the man holding that up 
um, in my eyes, is a champion among men. He's a boxing coach in Scotland. His name's Gordon Brennan. He runs Trench Boxing. He's also started his own group called One Thought at a Time, which is open to all the students for the school to be able to go along and talk about um, what's going on in their life, like if they have any problems in a safe place, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's not like they've got to go to a clinical area where they feel alienated already. They're going to an area where they already have relationships built with people yeah. um, and they find it easier to open up. So, Gordon commissioned me to do trench boxing because it's something that he loves it's something that inspired him to battle his own way through stage four lymphoma uh he's three years clear now um yeah it, it was great to be able to do it for him he's also wearing one of my t-shirts bless him oh, <laughs> good on him he's uh yeah i mean boxing as well that can be a great place but boxing arenas or like where they go to practice can be great places for guys yeah. um, i have a mate who's a boxing coach as well and a lot of young guys find it you know it's not like they're necessarily going to be boxers but it's a, pl a safe place for them there's other yeah. guys but they they feel kind of held and safe if the people who are training and the coaches yeah. are open and caring and stuff so it can be a really yeah. good place we skip forward one slide yeah. uh and again sorry another one this one uh, so learn, adapt, evolve. This is another personal friend of mine, Dean Hepburn, who works with professional and amateur um, fighters. You know, he teaches jujitsu and MMA. And the, the stunning similarity for me between Dean and Gordon is both that they're extremely masculine people that have no problem talking about their emotions. You know, I think if you said to them that it makes them less masculine, opening up like that, they would laugh you out of the building. You know, there's, there's nothing not masculine about a guy that can just take your head off. Um, <laughs> but they're more than willing and they are both stepping out of their comfort zone and raising up people around them. Right. Yeah. I mean, people say, you know, still you still hear comments like, uh, you know, put your big man's short pants on or, you know, have the balls to do this and man up. Exactly. Man up. Yeah. These kind, But those kind of phrases are kind of indicative of what you're talking about, where like if you're a guy, just suck it up and, you know, yeah. keep it down. Walk it off. It. Yeah. Shake it off. And like things are not like that life is not like that can we see um the other one as well shahira yeah this is great this one uh this was a commission um i'm not overly familiar with the band it's Lionheart lyrics i think um but the words themselves yeah. i am not my failures i am not my fears that i think a lot of people could use reminding it's it's so easy to only focus on the things that you can't achieve and it's a very western attitude to only focus on the things that we didn't achieve or we, we can't quite do yet, rather than celebrating the things that we can. Yeah, and that's a good thing to remind us as well that, you know, because we do beat up on ourselves and like, why can't, why aren't I better at that, you know, and, and fixate on the bad points instead of looking at the good points. Because again, it goes back to like growing up and when you're young, and what Rebecca was talking about, if the people around you are like, don't get a big head, don't give them a big head, you know, don't sort of like that yeah. it's bragging or boasting instead of like, it's a confidence thing, which we yeah. all need. Yeah. yeah. So um, just a, a question from one of um, our attendees tonight, Debbie. Thanks, Debbie. Do you always agree to tattoo what someone requests or do you question their reasons and will that depend on where they want the tattoo? Good question. Thanks, Debbie and Brian. Yeah, uh, no, I won't always tattoo things out outright. I don't tattoo anything hate related. Um, these days I don't get asked for things like National Front tattoos or swastikas, stickers, but I have been asked for them in the past and I've always said that I wouldn't do it. Uh, when it comes to placement on the body, I'm still a firm believer in you should earn your tattoos. Um, I won't tattoo hands unless people have sleeves. I won't tattoo necks unless people have hands. Generally speaking, I do make exceptions for that. Like I had uh, an older lady come to me. She was well in her 60s and she wanted to get her hands tattooed. She didn't have any other tattoos, but I had no problem in doing that. She's already paid the devil's dues. <laughs> I'm going to tell her what to not do. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think there's a... a 
level of responsibility as a tattooist that if an 18 year old comes into me and he wanted something negative put on him I would try and talk him out of it if he wanted it blast across the side of his neck for his fur tattoo I'm definitely not doing that one Ah, oh, here's another question for you uh, from Darren McCarthy. Hi, Darren. In, um, I know you're in the Netherlands. Uh, do you believe you can tackle toxic masculinity through tattoos? And has there been a trend towards both sexes being open to styles more commonly associated with the opposite? Great question with the opposite gender. So the mix up of like styles of tattoos and um, yeah, that toxic I, masculinity. Can I see days for a female to get tattooed than it is for a male. Like a, a large percentage of the people walking into studios to get tattooed are females. Uh, and I think that has spun out of not only the fact that they, they can see it's a genuine piece of artwork. Mm -hmm. You know, they get huge, beautiful, bright colors or flowers, floral stuff done on them, very decorative. And it doesn't come across as masculine. Um, but we are in a time where the, the binary male, female is almost being ignored now. And people want to branch out. And if they want, if it's a female that wants to get very masculine tattoos, I'm not going to be the one that says no. Mm -hmm. Like that's her claiming her, her own identity. You know, mm -hmm. if she wants to put that out in the world and it makes her more comfortable in her own skin, I think that should be something that's celebrated and not cast aside. Cool. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think we're just like, yeah, almost out of time, actually almost out of time. Um, so is there anything else? Is there uh, anything else you would like to add to this? Because like it's, it is a really interesting thing and something that needs to be talked about, obviously, um, like mental health, because guys, uh, just guys not being able to talk about things and encouraged to. Um, anything else to add to that, guys? I mean, uh, Brownie first, because I know you have a few, you, um, I think they were on the slideshow there, but you know a few places as well where guys can go. I do, yeah. yeah. There's, uh, there's one thought at a time, which is Dunfermline in Scotland. Uh, also, SY Familia. We actually skipped over the slide there. Sorry, we skipped past that. Right. Um, but that is South Yorkshire. Um, that's a group of men that are form of a bike club that also want to be able to in, like, provide a safe space for men like that. But yeah. that's a typically masculine thing. You know, you don't expect huge hairy bikers to have a lot of emotions going on. But often you get talking to them, you find their untapped wells. There it is. Oh, there it is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can always type it in the chat box if you want anyone to know about it. Um, that's yeah, that's great. Um, uh, Rebecca, anything, any last uh, thoughts? I just wanted to chip in on a couple of bits there, really. Mm. I didn't want to kind of try and take over or anything, um, but a lot of what you were saying really resonates. Um, mm. So I created, this sounds ridiculous, I created the, the first male psychology module at, at our university. Mm. Um, and the reason why we consider it the first in the world is because it takes the biological and evolutionary perspective rather than just a, a social kind of gendered perspective. And we look at a lot of the things that you were talking about, about um, groups and how male therapy and female therapy is, is often, you know, the ideal forms is often very different and men tend to respond a lot better to group forms and especially when we might not consider it as therapy, you know, like as, you know, I'm going to go and see the therapist and I'm going to sit opposite the therapist and we're going to talk about this. Um, and often that's not what's best for, for men. And men, like you say, tend to respond really well to these kind of group settings and a lot of it as well. I think, you know, someone in the chat mentioned about toxic masculinity and things. Um, and you mentioned as well, Brownie, a lot about you know this isn't what we would expect of of a masculine you know a masculine kind of person to do and things and it's like reframing masculinity and uh not just you know shutting your emotions off pulling your big boy pants up and things like that and about really taking ownership and care of your friends looking out for people um yeah. like the people you've mentioned um yeah. so i just kind of wanted to chip in and kind of support what you're seeing <laughs> thanks very much yeah i think that you know being able to support others and raise them up is actually like a really good leadership quality which is always exactly. like traditionally been viewed as a masculine thing definitely it's core to masculinity 
but yeah like why shouldn't you be able to open up like that and i think that also being able to see somebody that you look up to open up inspires a lot of other people to be able to do the same yeah exactly it does and it again comes back to that leadership taking ownership being strong enough to be able to do that yeah um i think it's really important great Great. Guys, thank you so much uh, for agreeing to come on tonight. And um, it was so interesting. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you, Brownie. Uh, brilliant. Great. I've really enjoyed it. And I hope um, the people listening have enjoyed it too. Good luck with all your endeavours. And um, yeah, and I just think it would be great to be one of your students, Rebecca. <laughs> it's a really fascinating subject. Thanks, guys. Thanks, yeah. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Everyone. Cheers. Bye. Thank you, Shahira, as well. Bye -bye. Thanks, Shahira. Yeah. Bye.